Vietnam. Let's really show Amitav Ghosh how happy we are that he has been here, not just the last two days as a fellow, but pretty much the month. So Amitav Ghosh. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. There are many people joining us through a YouTube live stream. And I say to those of you who are roughly in the time zone near here, you North American folks and South American, Central American folks, you guys are obviously not working. You should be have one screen on your job and one screen on us. Thank you for taking time off. Those of you, many, many folks who are further ahead of us, in fact, a number of people who are way far ahead of us, 13 hours and 12 hours, uh, happy evening to you. You're not skimping off of work. So um, so we have uh, someone who is, who is doing it. Sophia DuRose, where are you, Sophia? She's in, I think Sophia's out there in the ante room. Um, Sophia's gonna be joining Yep, she's going to be joining the YouTube chat, and we take that seriously. Even though some or most of what you say will not come to us here, we, we invite you to chat and pose questions. Good morning. We invite you to uh, pose questions and chat, and Sophia will respond, and we will, we will grab a recording or a, a copy of that, Amitav, for you in case you're interested in who's joining us from afar. Um, March 2nd and 3rd. There is, I guess we can announce it even though we're not sure about the venue yet. Um, so do you want to describe, Amitav, what's happening on March 2nd and 3rd here at Penn? Oh, yes. Well, uh, I wrote uh, uh, an adaptation of a legend of the Sundarban. Uh, you all know uh, the Sundarban, right? It's the great mangrove forest in, uh, in Bengal. It sprawls over Indian Bengal and Bangladesh. So I, uh, I did an adaptation of a folk legend of the Sundarban. Uh, the legend is about uh, uh, a being called Bun Bibi. And uh, it's, a, it's a very interestingly hybrid legend because Bun Bibi uh, is uh, actually both a Hindu and Muslim. I mean, she is said to come to Bengal from uh, Medina, uh, you know, in Saudi Arabia, uh, now Saudi Arabia. Uh, but she is worshipped, uh, you know, by Hindus like a goddess, uh, by Muslims like a sort of Sufi saint, and uh, there's a, there's a whole sort of ritual complex around her. But there's also this legend about Bon Bibi and how she, uh, you know, creates a balance between the needs of humans and the needs of other beings. Uh, this legend is actually written in a in a very uh, common Bengali verse meter. Uh, and I, uh, the meter is, uh, it's a 12 syllable line, so 12 syllable couplets, so 24 syllables each couplet, and each line has a caesura. Uh, and I, ad uh, I adapted it uh, in the same meter in English. Uh, you know, I had a, I had a friend. Sounds like an easy job adapting it to the same meter in English. Once you get into it, it's not that difficult, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, and strangely, uh, you know, uh, I worked with my translators who were translating it into Italian. Uh, and in Italian, uh, there is exactly the same meter, you know, a 12-syllable line. So, uh, you, know, it's, you know, it's a strange thing. When you start working with rhyme, which I imagine in, you don't. In, uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, you do know me well. No, no rhymes. But in Italy, it's easier. In Italian, it's easier to rhyme than in English. Uh, that's not what they say, but <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> everybody else says yes. But um, uh, uh, you know, it was such a such a strange experience for me to be working with meter with meter and rhyme because uh, you know you suddenly realize that there's this whole part of your brain uh, that you never use. You know, I mean I, I mean, I know my brain pretty well because I've been using it for a long time. <laughs> but uh, I suddenly, you know, so at the end of a day of writing prose, you can feel, you know, where you're strained or where you're stressed. But uh, this, at the end of the working day, it was in some completely different place. And I suddenly realized that, you know, modernity has created this circumstance whereby there's an entire sort of faculty, a neurological faculty, which we don't use. Uh, at all. In fact, uh, that's why, you know, rappers, uh, you know, they use rhyme so brilliantly because 
uh, they're just drawing on this faculty which uh, lives in the brain, you know. Anyway, so once you do it, it's just so thrilling, actually. Anyway, uh, so I adapted it in verse, and uh, then uh, I collaborated with a, uh, with a, with a Pakistani-American artist uh, called Salman Tour, who's become incredibly successful and famous. And uh, we adapted it uh, into, I wanted to make something like an illuminated manuscript, you know, a modern version of it. And I think, uh, really, Salman's work uh, succeeded in doing that. And then, uh, you know, what I wanted to do is, this legend exists, like all legends, in multiple iterations, you know? It exists as a performance, it exists, uh, uh, you know, as a, um, as, a, as a text, and so on. So I wanted to do the same thing, uh, because I've grown very tired of, uh, you know, these logocentric things like this, which exists only... Oh, no. Uh, yes. You're throwing your novels under the bus. <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, <coughs> Uh, yeah, so th uh, then uh, I, did, uh, I did, I collaborated with, again, a, a Pakistani-American musician called Ali Sethi, who's very, very famous now. And uh, uh, he uh, basically created an audio version. And then uh, your colleague Deborah Thomas uh, invited me here to the Center for Experimental Ethnography. And we decided that what we'd do is turn it into a performance. And the amazing Brooke O'Hara, uh, yes. your colleague, uh, she's been working with us and it's been coming along amazingly. So on the second and the third are the two performances, and both performances are sold out, <laughs> and sold out even on Zoom, apparently. Which is something to think about. <laughs> something is sold out on Zoom. So we're looking for a new venue, but we're saying here in this room that on March 2nd and 3rd at 7 p.m. each night, there will be a performance, and very likely you'll be getting an announcement. We have RSVPs for most of you. We'll get an announcement out to you about where it is, and we highly recommend it. This morning, we're going to spend about an hour having a conversation um, in the process of teaching and uh, reading and rereading for the last seven weeks or so with my students in the Writer's House Fellow Seminar. I've gotten all excited about certain particular questions that I want to ask Amitav about certain passages and so forth. And we want you to be involved in that as well. So I will ask a couple of questions, the conversation will get started, and then very quickly we will turn to you. And we have someone with a portable mic, Zach, don't we? Are we? <laughs> it's the same Sophia Du Rose who seems to be doing the chat and that is fantastic. Thank you, Sophia. So we'll turn to you. The reason we want you to wait for the mic for your question is because the you people watching on YouTube won't be able to hear you unless you wait for the mic. Um, I wanted to thank Lily Applebaum. I don't know if Lily is here yet this morning. She's on her way, but she's the coordinator of Kelly Writers House Fellows. She handles all the details. And in fact, this is her 10th year doing fellows. Uh, that means 30 very famous writers many of whom are not nearly as fun and easy to deal with as you are. <laughs> um, and, and Lily does such a, a great job. So I just wanted to acknowledge that. Also, we, are, we have books for sale, three of them. The most recent book, and we'll be talking about this today, which is The Nutmeg, Nutmeg's Curse, and the subtitle is Parables for a Planet in Crisis. We have that book, I think, in paperback, do we? Or I know this is in hardcover, I think. Uh, Gun Island, a recent novel. We have that in paperback. And I believe we have lots of copies of The Hungry Tide in a, a bigger format, I think, a paperback. And so if you want to purchase any or all of those books, you can do that. And at the end, Amitav, I think, would be willing to stay a little bit to sign and scribe your books. So fantastic. Thank you again for coming. Amitav, this book is really a radical book. There's, it's full of radical ideas. And because it's organized in the Gaussian way that we've been celebrating the last couple of days, which is to say it's n the argument is not necessarily linear because its very point is that that would be falling into a, a, an old mode that Amitav is assiduously working to break. So, the, so the, it's organized almost as a constellation or a convergence or confluence, which is a favorite word of yours, a confluence of ideas. And I just thought, wanted to raise one of those ideas, one of the radical ideas, and ask you about it. 
um, it's, you, you're reading along and you get to the point where Amitav is talking about how Dutch colonialism, which is how the book starts, gave way to a flourishing of the arts in the 17th century, which all of us have always you know, learned to celebrate in school, especially when you get to those still lifes. You know, you get to the still life, you think, oh my gosh, that's so great. And meanwhile, you're reading this guy, and they become, and you're not the only one who says this, but you summarize, they become mute assemblages of ready comestibles, reduced nature to a state of inertness, and part of a system of racial capitalism. And then you read on to the next radical idea. So I wanted to ask you about that. Um, you are not, as we've talked about, not constrained by being at an academic institution and needing to get tenure as everybody looks at the citations and decides whether it was a legitimate thing to, to throw out still lives with and calling them part of racial capitalism. How do you go about that? How confident are you with, you know, you obviously do a ton of research. What is it like to be, to be tossing out ideas? Have you gotten reactions to that? Are every, is everybody, all your favorite readers, selling all their still lives as a result. What's happening with that? And that's a really good example of the way this book works. Uh, well, thank you for that. I wouldn't by any means advise anyone to throw out their still lives. I mean, <laughs> uh, you know, it's a moment in history and uh, throwing it out won't, uh, won't make a difference. But it is, in, it is interesting, you know, I mean, uh, at just that moment when philosophers are coming up with the idea uh, that the earth, uh, uh, that the earth is a giant clock, you know, and God is a clockmaker, and so on, uh, and that humans are the only uh, agentive species, the only ones who are capable of being historical subjects, and so on and so forth, and that uh, the uh, the environment is essentially inert or dead, mm. you know, and uh, so you get still lives. That, but really, the word, uh, the the phrase that sums up <coughs> uh, the conceptualization of those still lives is nature mort, right. uh, you know, that uh, nature, dead nature, uh, you know. And uh, I, I think it's a very important moment, you know, in, uh, uh, in the coming to be uh, of, of modernity, the, uh, uh, where people really imagine that the earth is dead, that, uh, you know, forests are dead, that uh, trees are essentially just machines, that animals are just robots. It's a, it's a very strange way of thinking, if you think about it. Uh, and, you know, even though this became completely the dominant elite ideology, I think even to this day, the great majority of human beings don't believe it. You know, the vast majority don't. I mean, if you go to Indonesia, for example, uh, to this day, for even for elite Indonesians, volcanoes are alive. You know, uh, uh, Ma uh, Mount Merapi has a has a keeper, and politicians, in order to go get elected, have to go to this keeper and sort of placate him and so on. So uh, you know, I think even within Europe, I mean, pe uh, farmers and people who work with the land don't subscribe to this view, and uh, really, you know. Uh, there are so many interesting. Uh, uh, you, are you guys at all familiar with the work of Ernesto de Martino? It's very strange. He's a, he's a, he was an Italian uh, anthropologist of the 40s, 50s, 60s, a very, very important thinker. And in Italy, he's, re he's regarded as a, as a completely seminal thinker. But he's completely unknown outside, uh, outside Italy. Uh, you know, he was an anthropologist, but his work is not read. Uh, but uh, his his work, his most important work, is on uh, Tarantism. Mm. Uh, you know, which is uh, uh, the the idea that uh, uh, that uh, spiders uh, have this type of kind of special relationship with uh, human beings and can create spirit possession and cults. Uh, you know, tr spirit trances and so on. And uh, you know this cult is st still alive today, even though, and it was historically uh, a part of Catholicism. The Catholic Church over there embraced it, but uh, since the '60s, uh, they've uh, they've they've kind of stepped away from it, and uh, you know the, the Church no longer 
participates in the uh, in the rituals of tarantismo but uh, you know so it's it's so interesting that uh, you have now all these studies coming out uh, of uh, farmers and peasants within europe who are by no means uh, mechanists if there is something a writer can learn or maybe young writers can learn being introduced to some of these ideas in here from the way in which the still life in the 17th century was associated with extermination, that's a word you use only a couple paragraphs later, or, or, or thinking of still lifes as not uh, an innovation in an art, in a culture that was thriving economically, but in fact directly tied to terraforming. Uh, what what can a writer learn? How how not? I mean, I think you're reading your books would be a great example of a writing that is fluid and transforming all the time and not fixed and not inert. But it is yes a lesson for us of thinking about art and making art that is not dead nature. Would you go? Is that overstating things? Um, I think we can only approach a question like that historically, so to speak. Mm. Because you know what happens uh, is that uh, the nutmeg, uh, you know, it's the gift of this amazing tree, the nutmeg tree, uh, and which also produces mace, because mace is really just the outer covering of the nutmeg. And this tree grew only in a very remote part of the Malaccas, you know, so near, uh, near what is now Timor. You know, it's the Banda Archipelago. But the Banda Archipelago is literally tiny. There were six tiny islands. You can walk across each of them in like half an hour or uh, 45 minutes or whatever. So these islands produced, uh, uh, they were the home of this particular tree. And this, uh, the, from antiquity, you know, I mean, uh, three or 4,000 years ago, nutmegs began to circulate uh, across uh, Africa and Eurasia. And they were incredibly valuable. And the value kept rising over time. So uh, you know, the, the Bandanese became very expert merchants and traders. They would go, uh, they would trade, their, uh, they would trade their, their products, and people would go. And uh, merchants from all across the littoral of the Indian Ocean would go and live there. Uh, uh, but so the, the, the value of nutmegs kept rising, especially in Europe because there was a rumor that nutmegs could cure the plague. And this was certainly believed, especially in Elizabeth, Elizabethan uh, England. Uh, so there was a, there was a point uh, in, the, uh, in the early modern era, very early modern era, uh, when uh, a handful of nutmegs could buy you a house or a ship. You know? So actually, uh, you know, these voyages of exploration, one of the first things they went looking for were these nutmeg islands. Uh, and also, you know, from the Malaccas also came this other amazing tree, the clove. Uh, you know, so they went, um, so very soon after Vasco da Gama had opened the, uh, the route to the Indian Ocean, uh, the Portuguese turned up in the Banda Islands, then the Spanish followed, and all of them had this idea that they wanted to impose a monopoly on the nutmeg, uh, on the spice trade. So they were always searching for this monopoly, which is a completely alien idea to the, uh, to the Indian Ocean. But it was a very uh, alive idea in the Mediterranean because uh, the Venetian Republic actually had a spice monopoly in the Eastern Mediterranean. So they wanted to create a similar system in the Indian Ocean. But of course, uh, you know, it, was so, it was so contrary to ed ev everything that existed in the Indian Ocean that it wasn't possible. But, uh, so the Dutch, who were much, uh, much, <laughs> what, what can you say, much more ruthless, more determined, but also more successful uh, than the Portuguese and the Spanish, they uh, arrived <coughs> at the Banda Islands in 1600. And lo and behold, as, this, uh, as their ships were sailing up, the volcano erupted. Uh, the great volcano of the Bandas is, Gununga, uh, is Gunungapi. And uh, the nutmeg is thought to be the gift of Gunungapi. Hmm. So uh, anyway, the Dutch arrived. Uh, they tried to impose a monopoly. Uh, naturally, the Bandanese resisted. The Bandanese are a, were a tiny group, just 15,000 people. So they tried to resist. Then in 1621, the man who's thought, said to be the, 
uh, the, the great founder of the Dutch East, uh, East Indian Empire, a man called Jan Peterson Kuhn, uh, he, led, uh, he led a fleet to the Bandas. And basically, uh, you know, in a period of a few weeks, he completely eliminated the entire population of these islands. He killed several thousand. The Dutch soldiers killed several thousand. Uh, they drove several thousand away uh, into places where they starved to death. And uh, they enslaved the rest and took them away to Java and other places. So they completely depopulated uh, the Banda Islands. And then they did what Europeans were basically doing across the Americas. They repopulated it with slaves. They repopulated it with uh, white planters. They divided up the islands into plantations. They created this plantation economy there. So they brought in sort of like Dutch descended uh, perkenier, they were called. Uh, and uh, you know, put them in charge of these uh, uh, of these plantations with slaves, <coughs> most of whom were actually brought in from uh, uh, South Asia. Uh, so you know, it's a it's a very interesting thing that if you think about it, uh, for the Bandanese, uh, to this day, you know, uh, the Bandanese have songs about the nutmeg. They sing about the nutmeg. They sing about Gunungapi. Gunungapi is for them a live thing. This volcano, you know. So, so are the nutmegs. Even though, uh, you know, this this tree, which was their great blessing, and which uh, you know made them prosperous and rich, ultimately ultimately became their great curse. You know, it led. So they were the first victims of what you might call the resource curse. You know. So. Uh, you know, if you think about that way of relating to an object, you know, it's not just a resource. I mean, the nutmeg for them is not just an economic thing. It exists, it has multiple sorts of avatars, you know, in which it exists for them. And just think about how strange this is, that, you know, for 2,000 years or more, sailors from, uh, merchants from across this whole Indian Ocean region, from China, from, uh, from Africa, were making this very long and difficult journey to this remote part of the Indian Ocean. And they were living there often for years. So they obviously knew how to grow a nutmeg tree. They could just have taken it away, mm. you know, and planted it as the Dutch did later. But they never did. Nobody ever did. Why? Because, in effect, a nutmeg wasn't a nutmeg unless it came from the Bandas. You know, just as a Burgundy wine isn't a Burgundy wine unless it comes from Burgundy. You know, we recognize the a relationship between terroir, people, uh, and the product. You know, and uh, the, there's this sort of uh, what? What can you say? It's a sort of uh, iterative relationship between people and land. And you know, the Dutch would never. It would never have occurred to them to say, okay, let's go and kill all the, uh, all the people in Burgundy and uh, you know, start, uh, start producing uh, their wines, <laughs> because they knew. But simply because they're in this colonial context, simply because they're doing exactly the same thing in the Americas. You know, these are the two bookends of the Dutch and the English empires. On the one hand, uh, it's the Spice Islands. On the other hand, it's Connecticut and this region. You know, so they're fighting these incredibly bloody wars uh, against uh, various uh, indigenous groups. And they, they take exactly that tactic uh, to the Banda Islands. I mean, so I, I think Jan Peterson Kuhn could never have thought of just eliminating all the Bandanese unless uh, mm -hmm. in the, they had had this experience in North America because this is what they had done. You know, for, actually, by that time, it was 100 years old, the, this policy of just eliminating all the natives, you know. So uh, you know, th it's in this way that you see this this sort of strange sort of movement that happens. First, this violence against people, then the violence against products, if you like, and then all of this becomes congealed in uh, in this ideological apparatus, which emerges at exactly the same time, th which is the early 17th century. Descartes, you know, even though he's French, he's spending most of his time uh, in Holland. You know where he's closely connected, uh, actually, with uh, um, uh, with these imperial structures, or if you think of uh, you know all the uh, major uh, English philosophers of the period, all of them have investments in, in in colonies. You know they have investments in slaves uh, in colonies. So I think that actually that whole philosophical structure of that Enlightenment 
emerges from, uh, from violence between human beings in the first instance. And as we now know, in fact, all the, all the things that we celebrate about the Enlightenment, as David Graeber and David Wengro have shown in their brilliant new book, Dawn of Everything, all those ideas actually, you know, freedom, equality, etc., all came from Native Americans. You know, it all came from the Native American encounter. You know, so <clears throat> if you look on this history, or indeed on this sort of whole structure of philosophy, mm. uh, you know, you see these sort of strange connections. And out of those strange connections is also born this art, which, uh, which reaches its apogee. In exa I mean, you know, Descartes and Rembrandt and all of them are contemporaries. Mm. And Jan Peterson Kuhn, you know, they're all contemporaries. It's the, it's the enormous wealth that they get uh, from the Banda Islands and from the Malaccas that makes possible this great flourishing of art. But, you know, if you read all the standard uh, books, uh, like, say, Simon Sharma's and so on, and Simon Sharma thinks a lot about genocide and so on, uh, but uh, not a word about the Bandanese or the, you know. I want to turn to your boyhood uh, and reading. Um, you've written about that. It's an essay called Testimony of My Grandfather's Bookcase. It goes back to uh, 1998. And one of the things that we find out is that the bookcase, I think these were translated to Bengali, I guess, right? No, um, no, they were in English. They were in English, okay. Uh, among the uh, novelists that you read were two that you point out that I want to ask you about. One is John Steinbeck, whom you mentioned yesterday a couple times. And another is Upton Sinclair. Um, <laughs> And uh, the reason you brought up Steinbeck yesterday is that Steinbeck did a lot of research that was somewhat a cousin to the research you were doing in Italy, uh, talking to migrants uh, for uh, the Grapes of Wrath. He did research you know, by talking to a lot of people. Anyway, I'm, I don't know if that's what struck you way back when you were a boy. But can you talk a little bit about encountering Steinbeck and Sinclair in Calcutta at your grandfather's bookcase? Uh, well. You know, Steinbeck's uh, Grapes of Wrath was a, uh, a book that I responded to very, um, you know, very directly uh, way back when I read it. Uh, but what also struck me very much is that, you know, over the years, uh, I've traveled a lot in Asia, I've met a lot of writers. And every time I've asked an Asian writer, like Pramudia Anantatur, you know, the great uh, Indonesian writer, uh, I remember asking him, uh, you know, who, who were your influences? Who were the great uh, uh, writers uh, that you read? And you know the names that come up? Can you, can, can you take a guess? Some of the Russian novelists? Yes, but uh, it's always, they're always the same ones. Uh, Steinbeck, Gogol, Gorky. Mm. Gorky, <laughs> right, know. Gorky. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, always, it's always them. And, uh, it was so striking to me. I mean, I asked uh, Miathan Tint, who's, uh, who was a, a very famous Burmese writer, the same question. He, told, he said the same thing. And I think if you were to ask this question of the major Indian writers uh, of that, of that uh, generation, uh, they would have said the same. So, uh, you know, you would never hear an Asian writer say uh, that Hemingway was their great influence. Mm -hmm. or whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's a curious thing. Steinbeck, you know, even though even today he's perhaps uh, within America one of the most read writers. Uh, in his own time, uh, the, the sort of dominant writers despised him. Mm, that's right. Uh, you know, they absolutely despised him. Hemingway, Fitzgerald absolutely despised him. I came across this little passage by André Gide, you know. André Gide had written uh, a positive review <laughs> of Grapes of Wrath. And for this, he lost all his friends in the Northeastern establishment. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so he says, you know, after that, I stopped writing reviews. <laughs> Can you imagine? So they hated him. Why? Yeah. And I yeah. think it's because uh, Stein of the material that Steinbeck was writing about. Well, there's the leftism, for one thing. But there's yeah. also this thing that you point out about the genre of the novel, which is important to you, that from the start, essentially, it depended on descriptions of place and setting. And in fact, this essay, this brilliant essay, Testimony of My Grandfather's Bookcase, is partly about that. And you turn at the end of the essay to a Bengali novelist, Bankim Chatterjee, and you talk about the um, complicated relationship he had to description in the novel. And you end it with him 
in a way that actually s gets kind of personal, I think. And I have an excerpt from the end of that, and I wondered if you would read it, and then we would talk about it a little bit. Um, this is so you might want to set set this up about Bunkim a little bit. Um, uh, Bunkim uh, Chatterjee was a very very important um, uh, figure, a thinker, a writer, uh, a sort of nationalist who's still. Uh, cited by especially right-wing Hindu nationalists nowadays. Uh, but he had a very important uh, uh, impact on um, Indian literature, modern Indian literature, and especially Bengali literature. And he wrote this book called Raj Mohan's Wife, which was uh, in English. He wrote the book Is it in his English. first English language novel? Or yeah, it yeah. was his first novel. Um, his first novel he wrote in English? Yeah. No, the, his first novel altogether. Right. Uh, so it's a, very, it's a very strange little book, you know. And what struck me about it very much is that uh, there are long passages of description of a Bengali house, what happens inside the house, etc. And it's very puzzling if you think, who is he describing this for? <laughs> uh, you know, because uh, uh, you know, presumably his readers are Bengalis, will know what the house, <laughs> what, a, what a Bengali house looks like. <laughs> so here is what I said. The passages of, of description in the book are not, in fact, intended to describe. <laughs> Their only function is that they are there at all. They are Bunkim's attempt to lay claim to the rhetoric of location, of place, uh, to mount a springboard that will uh, allow him to vault the gap between two entirely different conventions of narrative. It is for a related reason, I think, that Bun Bunkim conducted his rehearsal in English rather than Bengali. To write about one's surroundings is anything but natural. To even perceive one's immediate environment, one must somehow distance oneself from it. To describe it, one must assume a certain posture, a form of address. In other words, to locate oneself through prose, one must begin with an act of dislocation. It was this, perhaps, that English provided for Bunkim, a kind of disconnected soapbox on which he could test a certain form of address before trying it out in Bengali. Mm. This still leaves a question. Every form of address assumes a listener, a silent participant. Who was the listener in Bunkim's mind when he was working on Raj Mohan's wife? The answer, I think, is the bookcase. It's the very vastness and cosmopolitanism of the fictional bookcase that requires novelists to locate themselves in relation to it the demands of their work that it carry marks to establish their location. This then is the peculiar paradox of the novel. Those of us who love novels often read them because of the eloquence with which they communicate a sense of place. Yet the truth is that it is the very loss of a lived sense of place that makes their fictional representation possible. That's amazing. To what extent, Amitav, does this describe you? and your, your relationship to the novel as a genre, and your sense of dislocation, your writing in English, and so forth? Um, you know, I think the, uh, the point that I was trying to make here is that it's not just uh, in relationship to someone like me, who's obviously dislocated, uh, but I think the very act of writing novels is, mm. uh, comes out, uh, out of a sense of dislocation, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. you're, in a co you're in conversation with other kinds of now, with so many other novels, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, I mean, there's this whole sort of transnational uh, uh, tradition of novels going back to the early 19th century. Uh, you know, what um, the whole sort of um, wealth literature and so on. But again, you know, what is very interesting uh, about uh, Steinbeck's Great Sephiroth, and uh, I, I find myself very interested in this book, actually, because I think when I reread it recently, it became clear to me that it is, in fact, a climate change novel, yep. uh, avant la lettre. You know, uh, it's a uh, it's a novel. The first uh, the first chapter, very short chapter, but it's a really brilliant uh, uh, piece of writing about the environment, about uh, cl climatic change, and actually everything that happens in the book uh, is about uh, <laughs> you know exactly what we are experiencing today. A huge migration, you know, uh, that takes place. And actually, his brilliance lies uh, in that uh, he he places these migrants uh, inside a vehicle, 
you know, mm. which is actually, I think, a device that he borrows from Melville, uh, you know, because, uh, you know, when you have a lot of characters within uh, inside one vehicle, it creates the, those Aristotelian uh, uh, unities, you know, t- unities of time, place and action. The Joe Jalopy as the Pequod. Yes, exactly. Uh, though, I mean, it's, of course, not as... Uh, uh, as diverse as the Pequod, which we are told uh, yeah. has <laughs> like 40 different nationalities on yeah. it, including yeah. Parsi, Harpun- uh, ha- Harpooners. Not to mention an animal as the protagonist. That's right. But again, I really do think that, you know, uh, Steinbeck uh, creates a, a form there, uh, which is sort of really opens the gate to the kind of writing uh, that, uh, uh, that our present era demands. But also, you know, what is very interesting about the book, if you think about it, is that there's very little description in it, almost none, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, Instead, what you have are these long stretches of conversation in what he represents as kind of Oklahoma English. And he gets this by going to the various camps uh, in California and conducting these lengthy interviews over a, peri- over a very long period. And then he fell out with his collaborator, you know, uh, who, uh, who took him to all, these, uh, to all these camps and so on. Mm. But he did that work, you know. He went there, he interviewed people over a, over a long period of time, and out of that emerged this, uh, emerged this book, which I think really in future will be considered uh, the great the American Climate change novel. Yes, I think it will be considered the most yeah. relevant book uh, of, uh, you know, mid-century American writing. I have one more thing about this. Then we're going to turn to you for your questions. So think in the next minute or so about what question you want to ask. Um, when I read this, this is from 1998, when I read this, having already read this, I realized there is a consistent or, or developing arc of your thinking. And it's, it's what you're saying here is in here, although there's not as many references to the novel as a genre in here. But in part, the idea that to be in a place and then to describe a place in words is not a thing. That th- it's, a, it's a thing that dislocation makes possible. Did I get that right? And, and so this is a major concern in here about place and writing. Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, uh, you know, I'm not a kind of, uh, how shall I say, a person uh, who, who's like uh, very much into philosophy or any of those things. Uh, I, for me, my work emerges out of uh, encounters with people mm. and with the mm-hmm. land and so on, mm-hmm. you know. And in that sense, this book really did uh, emerge out of my encounter with a particular landscape that is the landscape of the mm-hmm. Banda Islands. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, as I was writing this book, actually, I began to realize that what I was doing. Uh, many of you will have read uh, Vine Deloria, uh, you know, the great Native American thinker. And he always argues that, in fact, uh, uh, the white man, as he calls uh, the Westerners, um, <coughs> uh, conceive of uh, narrative, storytelling, etc., all and history, most of all, uh, in terms of time, you know. Whereas uh, his argument is that uh, uh, the indigenous way of approaching uh, all these storytelling, history, uh, mythology is always in relation to space. You know, uh, Mm. spaces are uh, are what tell you about history. More than time. More than time, yes. uh, So uh, I realized then that actually this, uh, um, uh, my my book is kind of like a a topological narrative, you know, that it's about a topography. Uh, So it emerges out of a topography rather than out of a temporal dimension. I mean, the bibliographical footnote to what you just said would be a kind of suggestion for folks who haven't read the essays. Testimony of my grandfather's bookcase for his, the origin of a, a young Calcutta kid e- encountering the novel as a genre. Uh, and uh, what's the other essay we were just referring to? I'll think of it. In, oh, c- Confluence in, sorry, help me with that. Confluence in Crossroads, another essay that's very important in this regard. and. Hungry Tide, which is m- arguably the first climate change novel in your in your oeuvre, and Nutmeg's Curse. And if you follow these all the way through, you will get a, an amazingly coherent work overall. Okay, it's time to turn to you. Susie has a question. Let's wait for the mic to come to you, and then Rita, and thank you in advance. 
for your question. Hi. Uh, thank you first for coming in so generously, giving up your time and your wonderfully thoughtful answers to the amazing questions that Al poses. You, so my first question, I have two. One is formalist, one is more existential. Um, the formalist springs from what Al was just saying. In Gun Island, I'm interested in why you chose to have a first person narrator and also about what I feel is in many ways the dearth of description. So I get a lot of Venice. I can feel Venice. LA is restricted to the museum and the fires, but nothing else really. And Brooklyn is only a word. <laughs> I live in Brooklyn. There's nothing about Brooklyn. So why first person? Because my sense is mostly you've written in third. And also, what were you thinking? What's the interaction between that first person and landscape? Susie, with apologies, can we sw keep to that one question? Or was that two in one? It, it's two in Perfect. one. Perfect. There's another question. Now. Let's hold off on that one. Um, well, let me say, first of all, that I'm very gener generously <laughs> giving you of my time because he is very generously paying me. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> really? You're, that's, that's the only reason you've been generous? Uh, uh, as Dr. Johnson said, only a blockhead writes for anything other than money. <laughs> and you can buy a copy of the book that was just mentioned, Gun Island, here at the Kelly Writer's House. And, you know, not being a tenured professor, etc., means that, you know, for me, uh, um, I have to think about these things. But, uh, yeah, so, um, uh, so uh, the first person. You know, my second novel, which is actually uh, in India and in many other places my most popular novel, it's called The Shadow Lines, uh, was in the first person. And then I stopped writing for, uh, in the first person for a long time. But you know, then I wanted to come back to it because the first person can give you a sense of urgency. Uh, it can, uh, you know, create a sense of immediacy and so on. And I, I wanted to come back to that. So that's why I, um, uh, that's why I wanted to write, uh, you know, this book. I tried with the third person; it just didn't work, you know. You tried this book in third. I, I, mm -hmm. I tried, yeah, I, 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 Gun Island. I, I had a, you know, I always think that, you know. English has a default narrative mode, which is the third person um, uh, in the past tense, you know. And uh, I think one has to justify not using that default narrative mode. And I felt that uh, wh while I was working through this, that, uh, you know, it needed to be in the first person. Also, the first person is in so many ways so much more economical, you know. Uh, because it's in the first person, uh, I don't have to describe Brooklyn at great length or any of these other places. But apart from that, I can tell you as someone who's written about places that are very rarely written about, like Burma, uh, the Sundarban, and so on, that uh, you know, one of the great difficulties that arises in relation to these places is that readers don't have any mental map of those places. You know, uh, whereas uh, you know. For any reader, just to say Venice, uh, their mind is sort of uh, <laughs> overloaded with, uh, you know, with uh, imagery. You don't really have to bother, you know. Uh, it's the same for Brooklyn, I think, and it's the same for LA. I mean, uh, why go through all that? I mean, if uh, <laughs> if the imagery is already there, uh, you know. But uh, when when I write about Burma, uh, I have to I have to fill in the blanks, especially if I'm writing about uh, historical Burma. You know, this is a great difference between uh, someone who writes historical novels in America or in uh, England and someone who writes historical novels about uh, India or Burma. Uh, your English reader basically has uh, an image of, uh, you know, what a Tudor man uh, wears or, you know, what a ballroom is or, you know, all that kind of thing. 
They have no idea at all about what a Burmese court would look like, you know, or what a Burmese uh, a king would be wearing. So you have to go through all of that, you know. Thank you, Susie, for the question. Rita up front has a question. Sophia DuRose, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to just start with an appreciative comment. I was completely bowled over by the first chapter of the Nutmeg's Curse, especially as somebody descended from Dutch colonialism. <laughs> My historical guilt was uh, awakened most profoundly, and I could also see the connections even with that chapter and your very first book in an antique land, a kind of feeling of loss, uh, the loss of a kind of cosmopolitanism, uh, a, a kind of open trade, a possibility of open trade and cultural exchange, which capitalism um, uh, renders impossible. But I wanted to ask you about the uh, last chapter of The Great Derangement, when you invoke the, um, and I, this came as a big surprise to me, the papal encyclical on uh, caring for our common land. Uh, um, does that so? So I guess uh, two two questions, but feel free to elaborate as you as you choose. First of all, um, does that uh, invocation um, have something to do with the project that you're busy with now, um, using uh, using the old myth from the Sundarbans to create a kind of environmental consciousness? Uh, you you seem to think that. Um, you know, a Catholic texts might might have uh, some power of um, you know stirring uh, consciousness. And then I was just wondering if you had any what sort of feedback, critical feedback you've had since about uh, re you know ending that book in that way uh, by basically talking to the Pope. Thank you. Uh, you know, uh, let me just say first about your uh, first comment about the Dutch. Uh, actually, I've had a lot of people, uh, um, you know, saying to me, oh, my God, I didn't know that the Dutch were so horrible. But in fact, the Dutch were no more horrible than uh, uh, than the English or the um, or the Scottish uh, or the Portuguese or the Spanish. They were just doing what Europeans were doing. You know, uh, they were outliers. But it also has to be said for the Dutch that uh, the Dutch uh, much, much earlier than any other, uh, than any Francophone or Anglophone country, uh, began to reckon with their colonial legacies. You know, in the in the uh, early 19th century, I mean, you must know the book by Multatuli. Uh, yeah, uh, Max Havelaar, it's such an important book. And, uh, you know, they started taking down statues of Jan Peterson Kuhn uh, decades ago, uh, you know, where, uh, whereas uh, <laughs> the British have never done that, you know. But that reckoning is coming. I mean, it, uh, we saw it uh, during the pandemic, and it's going to carry on, you know. So I think it's important to recognize that about the Dutch as well. So uh, yes, uh, uh, your question was about uh, uh, the Great Derangement and uh, my feeling about the Pope's encyclical. Look, I think that the Pope is actually the only real leader in the world today. You know, I really think so. And uh, you know, in the last chapter of the Great Derangement, I compare uh, two documents that came out at about the same time. One is the papal encyclical, and the other is the uh, is the report of the um, uh, of COP26. You know the COP uh, no no sorry, COP20 COP20 the agreement uh, the Paris Agreement, and you can see the Paris Agreement is all about creating a kind of uh, of handing this problem over to uh, a, a kind of technocratic elite. Uh, you know, and all that they're interested in are these techno fixes of various kinds. You can see that the billionaires were there inserting their language. Uh, you can see, most of all, there's no reckoning with history. There's n nowhere in, uh, in the Paris Agreement is it said that uh, we recognize that this was a wrong path. You know, th th I mean, if you don't actually acknowledge that, where, how can you make a change? Uh, whereas, uh, you know, the great thing about the papal encyclical is that it's written in such incredibly lucid language. It's uh, very much informed by scientific opinion because uh, the pope had uh, a whole team of scientists advising him. But, you know, most of all, I'm, I'm struck by the, by, the, by the tone, by the rhetoric, you know, because it's written in such simple language. He's trying to open up the text, you know, because he recognizes his audience who are actually poor people, poor, vulnerable people in the global south. 
And he knows those people because he's been in Argentina and uh, in South America. So it's a very striking difference, you know. And ag again, it's completely full of an acknowledgement of past mistakes. Indeed, even an acknowledgement of the mistakes of Catholicism, you know, where and the doctrines of mastery and so on. And which is why he embraces uh, St. Francis of Assisi, who's really, you know, a Christian shaman, <laughs> you know. So it's a, uh, uh, but l let me say again that, uh, you know, I think that was the most heartening thing I saw in recent years. And he did more to bring the climate conversation into people's homes than any, 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 anybody else. Uh, but he's an outlier. Uh, and you can see uh, the incredible backlash against his thinking amongst conservative Catholics, especially in the US. Uh, but, uh, you know, around the world, the, the really sad thing is uh, that, you know, religions that shouldn't be going in that direction are taking to their own versions of, pros of the prosperity gospel. Uh, uh, you know, I mean, you see this in, uh, uh, in Erdogan's, uh, this is Erdogan's version of Islam. Uh, this is the, you know, the Hindu rights version of Hinduism. It's true even of Thai Buddhism today, you know, They've all embraced this idea that you just go and uh, extract, extract, extract. So, uh, you know, um, uh, Pope Francis and the Dalai Lama are absolutely outliers in this regard. Thank you, Rita. We're going to take one more question, either from the room or someone who's watching on YouTube. And then I'm going to ask Amitabh to conclude by reading a few paragraphs from the new book. And we have a question in the back there. Hi. Hi, thank you so much. I really enjoyed this. Um, so I'm wondering to what extent your current project um, adapting the, is it 17th century Bengali epic, is related to your uh, critique of the novel as a form? Um, and would you ever kind of write your own non-novel? Um, would you write in verse? Would you write in Bengali? Or do you feel that you know that would only ever end up as pastiche um, so you have to be adapting and kind of using earlier source material rather than trying to be non-modern as a modern wow. thank you that's a great, <laughs> great question. question and actually th that was exactly my thinking by the time i got to the end of the great derangement i think uh, you know modernism is a kind of exhausted impulse you know it 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 really cannot deal with the challenges that we are facing today it arises out of a sense of uh, complete uh, Western uh, supremacy, domination, etc. But that world is gone, uh, and you can see that those impulses are just, uh, you know, running out. So where else do we look? I mean, what, whatever we may say about mo modernism, it also gave us many wonderful, uh, many wonderful things, and it gave us many wonderful techniques, as in the novel and so on. But I felt that one, I had to look somewhere else, you know, for other literary forms. So I started uh, reading, uh, you know, pre-modern Bengali literature, and that was a great inspiration to me because one of the first things I saw there uh, was that these texts engaged with uh, environmental issues much more directly than modern Bengali literature, you know, and that was very striking to me. So yes, I mean, uh, I certainly feel that. Uh, a writer like me needs to engage with different forms, needs to experiment with different forms. So Jungle Nama is a different form for me. Gun Island is a different form for me. And I do feel that I want to engage more and more with, uh, uh, you know, I would like to turn Jungle Nama into, uh, into a game. Um. You know, I would like it to be one of the iterations because I think it's when you have these texts that exist in these multiple iterations uh, that you can, as it were, absorb uh, some of the uh, some of what these texts are actually striving to say, you know. Uh, so I, I do want to work with many different forms. <laughs> I started working with my son on a on a game version, uh, and uh, I, I'm actually going to. Uh, invest myself much more in performance, especially. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that great question. Thank you all. I wonder if we can conclude by looking at Nutmeg's Curse. Um, the students and I, in the weeks we discussed your work, um, fell in love with this particular passage because it was so lucid and so powerful. 
It comes at the end of a section on the violence that's entailed in naming and renaming, including the names given to the nutmeg itself. So this is, and you have a copy obviously here, this is the passage that begins, or you can just read it from mine, begins on 97 and goes to the end of the chapter. Yeah, sure. Oh, is that your favorite passage too, Billy Joe? Oh, that, well, that says something, I think. <laughs> a necessary first step toward telling a story about, say, nutmegs, is to leave behind a monoculture of naming that is intended to make all things comparable, a story in which the principal character is called Myristica Fragrance is never going to take wing. <laughs> For the enslaved gardener, Charles Rama, as for all Bengali speakers, the word for nutmeg would have been jayfal, which is a con uh, contraction of the Sanskrit jati fal. The precise meaning of jati is uncertain, but some scholars believe that it refers to jasmine, or more generally, fragrant flower. This is not the jati as in, uh, as in caste. Uh, there is no doubt at all, however, about the second element, phala, which means fruit, hence fragrant fruit. The Sanskrit term phala is the root also of the word for nutmeg in Bandanese, Bahasa Indonesia, and other Malay languages, pala. By contrast, the Dutch word for nutmeg is nut muscat, which like the English word comes from the Latin words for nut and musk, hence fragrant nut. It is the Dutch word for mace, fuli, that is derived from the Sanskrit phala by way of Bandanese and Malay. When I look at a pala lying in my palm and think of it as a jayfal, it is no great stretch to think of it as a tiny planet or as a maker of history or as something that hides within itself a vitality that endows it with the power to bless or curse. This possibility is not foreclosed even when I think of it as a nutmeg or nut muscat. It is only when I think of it as myristica fragrance that those thoughts evaporate and the nut becomes subdued and muted, reduced as was intended by the Linnaean system to the status of an inert resource. To think of it then as anything but a commodity seems childlike and fantastical, almost savage. To imagine that other aspect of the Pala's being in which it enters history as a potent force and a protagonist in songs and stories, it becomes necessary to remember that nutmegs have a hidden side which always eludes the eye. It is there that songs, poems, and stories reside. If this hemisphere withers, then the other two will eventually lose the meanings that give this tiny planet a place in the webs of life that sustain humanity. Amitav Ghosh. Thank you. Thank you so much for spending so much time with us at the Kelly Writers House as a Writers House Fellow. Thank you all for coming this morning. Remember, Amitabh will stay a little bit here. If you have books you want him to inscribe, we are selling books in the other room, uh, or just come and say hello to him. We might even have some leftover of the, they're no, all they're gone. all gone. I also want to just thank one more time Lily Applebaum, 10 years of coordinating Writers House Fellows. And one more time, Amitabh Ghosh, thank you so thank much. You. Thank you, thank you, Al. <laughs> That was fun. Thanks. Come back to the writer's house soon, everybody. Thank you.